This is the second part of the Parker University Continuing Education class on Boundaries. In the first part of the vodcast, we talked about the boundaries with respect to confidentiality. In this part, we're going to discuss boundaries with respect to sexual misconduct and how doctors can create boundaries to protect themselves from liability. Starting with a few quick comments about sexual misconduct. Uh, first quote comes from Woody Allen. Sex without love is a meaningless experience, but as far as meaningless experiences go, it's pretty damn good. Keep in mind that Woody Allen went through a very nasty divorce involving his relationship with his stepdaughter. So you may want to take his advice with a grain of salt. I think John Barrymore got it more accurate. Sex is the thing that takes up the least amount of time and causes the most amount of trouble. So for this vodcast, we're going to talk about the rules that prohibit sexual misconduct and how those rules can be very vague. We will talk about the exceptions or defenses that people think they may have or doctors think they may have. We'll talk about creating boundaries in the doctor-patient relationship to protect yourself. And lastly, we'll mention the consequences and how harsh they can be if you commit violations of these rules. Rules in Texas are relatively clear. In some other states, they're not nearly as clear. But even as clear as the rules are in Texas, they still include some provisions that are somewhat broad and vague. The Chiropractic Act says doctors can be disciplined for grossly unprofessional conduct. The Board of Chiropractic Examiners in the Administrative Code defined grossly unprofessional conduct as including engaging in sexual misconduct with a patient within the chiropractic patient relationship. The Board then went on to define sexual misconduct as including both sexual impropriety and sexual intimacy. Sexual intimacy includes most of the things that people would usually assume are sexual misconduct, intercourse, etc. Uh, I think this list is pretty act, pretty, uh, pretty self-evident and doesn't require a lot of explanation. But sexual misconduct also includes sexual impropriety. Sexual impropriety includes several provisions that can be vague. It also includes some provisions that I think give you a, a very good idea of how broad the Board of Chiropractic Examiners interprets the idea of sexual misconduct. Sexual impropriety includes any behavior, gestures, statements, or expressions which may reasonably be interpreted as inappropriately seductive sexually suggestive or sexually demeaning. This definition is pretty broad and can include a lot of different types of conduct. Uh, some examples of, of statements that I think may be sexually demeaning are things like dumb blonde jokes. I also think it can be demeaning to refer to your employees as the girls or the girl at the front desk. Uh, your employees have names and I encourage you to use their names rather than referring to them in a demeaning way based on their sex. Sexual impropriety also includes inappropriate sexual comments about and to a patient or former patient including sexual comments about an individual's body or sexual comments which demonstrate a lack of respect for the patient's privacy. Doctors should be careful about the comments they make to their patients, particularly when the patients are in a vulnerable situation, such as laying face down on the table or in a, in a gown. Uh, be very cautious about what you say. Uh, sexual impropriety also includes requesting unnecessary details of sexual history or sexual likes and dislikes from a patient. I find it very hard to imagine a situation where a chiropractor needs to make inquiries into those topics. I suppose it could occur, but if it occurs, the, the doctor should be very 
careful that they are asking the questions for the right reasons and that they communicate very clearly to the patient why they are asking those questions so it doesn't create an inappropriate impression on the patient. The board has also defined sexual impropriety as including making a request to date a patient. Think about that one for a minute and think about what it tells you about the board's interpretation of sexual misconduct. That means that if a doctor asks a patient for a date, that is sexual misconduct. It doesn't make any difference whether the patient says yes or no. It doesn't make any difference whether the date ever occurs or not. And it doesn't make any difference what happens on that date. It is sexual misconduct for a doctor to ask a patient out on a date. That to me tells you a lot about the board's interpretation of sexual misconduct. Sexual impropriety also includes initiating conversation about the doctors, the licensees, problems, sexual problems, preferences, or fantasies. There is never a situation where the doctor should be discussing those topics with a patient. Uh, kissing or fondling of a sexual nature, I think, is relatively straightforward. Uh, one comment I do want to make about placing your hands. Uh, doctors need to be very careful about communicating how they are touching and why they are touching patients to make it clear that they're not fondling the patient in a sexual manner. And then lastly, this, this last clause, like the first clause, is a very catch-all clause. Sexual impropriety includes any other deliberate or repeated comments, gestures, or physical acts not constituting sexual intimacies, but of a sexual nature. In other words, even though they've laid out some very specific items that are listed as sexual misconduct, the board leaves the door open that if there's something else or something they left off the list, they will certainly include that in their definition of sexual misconduct. Just kind of a couple general quick comments about making ethical decisions. Uh, Tex Texas Instruments uh, was well known or, or renowned for its uh, uh, culture and its advice to employees about how to make ethical decisions. Uh, this is not a complete list, and there are certainly better explanations of the Texas Instruments philosophy, but a few of the items they suggest in making these decisions is to think about whether the objective is to promote your personal or professional goals or values. So if a doctor is thinking about uh, uh, asking a patient for a date, for example, they should consider whether that's for their personal goals or part of their professional relationship with the patient. And if it's for their personal goals, they probably should not choose that course of action. Uh, second suggestion is whether the decision may generate strong feelings or other controversy. This may not always be evident, but it is common in doctor-patient relationships if, if the patient does not like the way the relationship goes, they will interpret or they will feel that the doctor abused their power over the patient uh, in creating that relationship. Uh, next item is the newspaper test. Think about the decision you're considering and think about how you would feel or how it would look if that decision showed up in the newspaper and the headlines. Would that create a favorable impression or would it create an unfavorable impression? Uh, what does your heart tell you? And, and you have to be honest in thinking about uh, uh, what you should and should not be doing and, and what your heart is telling you about what is right versus what you want. Uh, do I offer excuses? Most common one would be everybody else does it, so I should be able to do it as well. If that's your rationale for choosing a course of action, it's probably a mistake. Now, how am I going to feel tomorrow? Uh, think about 
the consequences of the relationship going down the road. I also think it's helpful, now this is not part of the Texas Instruments uh, uh, recommendations, but I think it's helpful to think about your interaction with the patient being videotaped and then having your mother or significant other or your child watch that videotape. Would you be proud of that interaction or would you be embarrassed for them to watch it? If you would be embarrassed, then that probably means that the way you're interacting with the patient is not appropriate. So if a complaint for sexual misconduct is filed, what defenses does the doctor have? Now the first one we're going to talk about is termination of the doctor-patient relationship. Some doctors seem to believe that as long as they terminate the doctor-patient relationship before the date occurs, then they don't have to worry about violations of these rules. Uh, that is not the case in Texas. The Texas rule provides that it is a defense if the patient was no longer emotionally dependent on the doctor and the professional relationship was terminated more than six months before the impropriety or intimacy occurred. Sometimes people will read that rule quickly and they'll read the six months and think that that's all that's required. But if you read it carefully, it requires two elements, both the six-month period and that the patient is no longer emotionally dependent on the doctor. Think about how you would prove that if a patient or somebody else were to file a complaint with the state board. How could you demonstrate that the patient was no longer emotionally dependent on the doctor? Very difficult, very challenging to prove, especially if the patient is a jilted ex-lover. Uh, they are likely to testify that there was emotional dependence and it will be almost impossible to contradict that testimony. The next exception is for patient's consent. In our society, we, we often think that what two consenting adults do in a bedroom by themselves, as long as no one is injured, it's, it's really not society's concern. We're not going to prohibit that conduct. Unfortunately, in the doctor-patient relationship, we have an imbalance of power between the doctor and the patient. And because we have that imbalance of power, consent is not a defense. The rule is very clear in Texas. The Board of Chiropractic Examiners says very plainly, it is not a defense if the sexual misconduct occurred with the consent of the patient. By the way, it's also not a defense that the misconduct occurred outside of professional treatment sessions or that the misconduct occurred off the premises uh, regularly used by the doctor for treating patients. Something else to think about with respect to consent is the idea of rape. Uh, rape is defined as sex without consent. Uh, the Texas Penal Code uses the term sexual assault rather than rape. And in that section it makes it very clear that a sexual assault is without the consent of the other person. If the actor is a health care services provider like a chiropractor who causes the other person who is a patient or former patient to submit or participate by exploiting the other person's emotional dependency on the actor. In other words, the doctor is not just committing an ethical violation, not just committing a violation that endangers their professional license, but the doctor could be committing a criminal act. And that, of course, is a second-degree felony public punishable by 2 to 20 years in prison. So those are the first two defenses. Termination of the doctor-patient relationship can work sometimes under certain limited circumstances. Patient's consent will never work as a defense, ever. The next exception that sometimes people think about is what if the sexual relationship started before the doctor-patient relationship started. I have to tell you the Texas rules do not address that exception. 
I also do not know of anybody, any doctor, who has been disciplined for that type of conduct. And if you think about it, if the concern is that we don't want the doctor to abuse their power over the patient, as long as the sexual relationship was established before the doctor-patient relationship, there is much less risk that the doctor abused that power uh, to take advantage of the patient. Uh, and the last exception I want to talk about is happily ever after. One comment I, I frequently receive when I give this lecture is, is I hear people tell me about doctors they know who married patients. And I do know that sometimes uh, relationships end with happily ever after. And in those situations, number one, it's very unlikely that anyone will file a complaint. The reality is these complaints are filed uh, uh, typically when somebody, when, when the relationship ends. The uh, uh, second thing is, is as long as it ends with happily ever after, it is unlikely that the doctor was truly abusing their power over the patient. But again, I have to tell you, on both of these last two exceptions, uh, happily ever after in the sexual relationship starting before the doctor-patient relationship, the Texas rules do not address either one of those exceptions. So I would be hesitant to rely upon either one of those. To protect themselves from sexual misconduct, doctors should establish clear boundaries in the doctor-patient relationship. Patients will look to doctors to explain and interpret and exemplify the conduct that is appropriate in the doctor-patient relationship. If the doctor flirts with the patient, the patient is going to think it's appropriate to flirt right back. And that's the kind of situation that can lead to problems. So what I'm going to do for this lecture is go over briefly ten boundaries. Uh, role, time, place and space, gifts, clothing, family and friends, self-disclosure, physical contact, money, and language. Uh, first one is role. It's a very basic question. Is the doctor acting like a chiropractor and a healer or acting in an inappropriate or some other manner? doesn't mean you have to be cold or standoffish with your patients, but it does mean you need to think about how you are communicating with your patients and whether you're communicating in a way that makes it clear that your objective is to help them get better. Second boundary is time. When should doctors be seeing patients? Usually during regular office hours. Rarely should doctors see patients either before or after their regular office hours. One pattern that seems to occur is when a doctor is thinking about misconduct with a patient, they start scheduling appointments with that patient outside of their regular office hours, either over a lunch hour, early in the morning or in the evenings when the other staff is not present in the office. Uh, phone calls to a patient at home or at night are usually not a good idea, certainly not later at night. Sometimes a call in the evening, particularly to a new patient, to uh, uh, confirm how they're doing uh, and to help re, re, uh, strengthen that doctor-patient rapport is acceptable. But certainly calls later in the evening after 8 or 9 p.m. are not appropriate. Time, I think, also includes the length of the appointment. How much time does the doctor spend with each patient? Certainly every patient will have different needs. Some patients will need more of the doctor's time than others. But the doctor needs to be conscious that they're not choosing to spend more time with patients that they find attractive. That is a flag that this doctor-patient relationship may be headed in an inappropriate direction and the doctor should be attentive to that. Uh, doctors can pretty easily use their staff or a simple little kitchen timer to help monitor the length of appointments. Uh, set the timer to go off and, and 
10 or 15 minutes or however long the appointment is supposed to last. And that'll be a clue to both the doctor and the patient when it, when it goes off that it's time to end the appointment so the doctor can move on to the next patient. Next boundary is place and space. Typically doctors should treat patients at their professional office. Home visits, there's certainly no rule that prohibits home visits and, and in certain circumstances it may be appropriate for the doctor to visit their patients in their homes or to treat patients in their homes. Uh, Doctors should be conscious of that situation and whenever possible should be careful to take somebody with them so if the patient later alleges some misconduct occurred, there is somebody else who witnessed the conduct who can talk about it. A more common problem is treating patients in social settings. I know that when I'm introduced to people for the first time, as soon as they find out I'm a lawyer, they almost immediately start asking me questions about traffic tickets, about taxes, about whatever kind of situation, legal situation they have. And I suspect the same is true for chiropractors. As soon as you're introduced to somebody as a chiropractor, uh, they quickly start asking you questions about their sore knee and their stiff back or stiff neck and asking you what they should do about it. It can be tempting in those situations to uh, uh, treat the patient and that is almost always a mistake. Number one, it teaches the patient to devalue the service that you are providing them. Number two, if anything goes wrong, if you're treating a patient at a party or in a bar or a restaurant, uh, even a quick little cervical adjustment, there is no expert witness that I have ever heard of who will testify that the type of patient history and examination that you conducted in that social setting was appropriate before you treated the patient. Questions are going to come up in social settings. That's typical and normal. You need to practice your response to those questions and the response really needs to be this is not an appropriate place to be discussing your health. Your health is more important than that. But if you would like to call my office we would be happy to schedule an appointment when I can conduct an appropriate examination and decide whether my services can help you. Now, the next boundary is gifts. Small gifts are not a problem. If somebody shows up at Christmas time, patient brings you a plate of cookies, there certainly is nothing wrong with that. The problem is larger gifts. If either the doctor or the patient is giving out larger gifts, where it would seem that something is expected in return, that gift is inappropriate. If a doctor ever receives that kind of gift, they should return it to the patient and politely and diplomatically explain that it is not necessary and not appropriate in the doctor-patient context. Uh, and depending on the circumstances, the doctor may also want to consider whether they need to terminate that doctor-patient relationship. Uh, next boundary is clothing. And if we talk about clothing, we're talking about clothing both of the patient and the doctor. The doctor needs to dress appropriately. Uh, my recommendation is to comply with the community expectations. Look at the other professionals in your community. As a younger doctor, you probably want to dress as well as or maybe a little bit better than those other professionals. Um, to send the message that you're acting as a professional and in, in not in some other capacity. Uh, individual expectations. Different patients, different cultures may have different expectations about clothing, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Uh, draping of patients. Uh, if you're conducting an examination where the patient is uh, in a gown, be conscious that you keep them appropriately draped and keep things covered up as much as possible. Be very respectful in the way you interact with the patient. Uh, one of the complaints that seems to occur more often than it should is a complaint that the doctor, and it's always a male doctor with a female patient, that the male doctor was putting their hands 
someplace that they were not supposed to be putting them and that the doctor was not keeping the patient appropriately draped. Communicate carefully with your patients. Keep them draped appropriately. If patients come in dressed inappropriately, you know, for example, in, in administering a side posture adjustment, if the patient is wearing a short skirt, um, they may be very easily exposed while you administer that adjustment. Uh, best practice is to think about how to keep them draped and covered appropriately. Uh, one thing the high schools do in Frisco that I think is uh, uh, very helpful, uh, when, when the students commit dress code violations, instead of sending the students home, what they do is they have sweatsuits that the students put on over their clothes. And, and those sweatsuits send a very clear message that they were dressed inappropriately. Now, I don't think it's right for doctors to shame their patients, but I do think it would be very easy for a doctor's office to keep several sets of uh, several different sizes and several sets of clean scrubs available. And if a patient shows up and they're dressed inappropriately for the kind of treatment the doctor's going to provide, the doctor may ask the patient to change into those scrubs so that they're not exposed. And then as part of that, the doctor can also explain to the patient how they can dress more appropriately in the future. Uh, disrobing practices. Uh, doctors should provide patients with privacy while they disrobe. They should leave the room. And doctors should knock on the door before they come back in after the patient's had a chance to change. If they happen to walk, if the doctor walks back into the room and the patient is still changing, or the patient has not put on the scrubs or the hospital gown, then the doctor should excuse themselves, close the door, and come back at a later time. Uh, last item I have on here is chaperoning practices. Um, one practice, if, if there is a patient that makes a doctor concerned, something about the personality or the way the patient interacts with the doctor, then the doctor should make it a point to have somebody else, preferably a staff member, in the room. Uh, instead of having the staff member just stand in the corner just as, a, a, as an observer, I think it's helpful and less obtrusive to bring them into the, the room and have them participate. So for example, if the doctor is conducting an exam, uh, the staff member can be present in the room and the staff member can be writing down some of the results, creating some of the documentation is the doctor is conducting the exam and the doctor can explain or, or communicate to the staff member what the results of this test were so they can document it correctly. Uh, that helps the doctor practice more efficiently and it also helps protect the doctor because if there's any claim of misconduct there was somebody else in the room the entire time that the doctor was in the room with the patient. Uh, family and friends. Before a doctor chooses to treat a family member or a close friend, the doctor needs to think about whether they are the best doctor for that patient's needs. And these are issues that apply not just to chiropractors, but to any kind of health care provider. Uh, they need to think about whether they have the right kind of training and can provide the right kind of service to take care of that family member or friend. Doctors should also think about whether that family member or friend will comply with the doctor's recommendations. Uh, most obvious example of this uh, is a spouse, husband or wife, telling their, their spouse that part of the reason they have low back problems is they are overweight and they need to lose 70 pounds. If that advice is coming from a spouse, it probably is not going to be followed or taken very well. On the other hand, if the advice is coming from a different doctor, it may be more likely to be followed or, or be taken seriously. The uh, doctor also has to consider whether they are willing to probe intimate history and to bear bad news. Sometimes when you have a dual relationship where the doctor is both a doctor and a family member or a friend, it may be difficult to ask some of the tough questions it may be difficult to share some of the bad news. Uh, and then lastly, the doctor has to monitor themselves to be objective enough uh, 
to provide appropriate care with an appropriate frequency. And that needs to be based on the needs of the patient, not based on the personal relationship between the doctor and the family member or friend. Uh, my recommendation is instead of treating close family members or friends, or excuse me, family members or close friends, uh, doctors, chiropractors can usually pretty easily find another chiropractor in the community uh, and make arrangements for that doctor to provide professional courtesy care for family and friends and, and enter an exchange where both doctors treat each other's family members and friends. That has the benefit of making your family and member, family members and friends schedule appointments with a doctor. They're more likely to take the care seriously when it comes from a, a different person, but they still get the benefit that they expect of free chiropractic care. Uh, next boundary is physician self-disclosure. Typically, doctors should be listening to the patient, asking the patient about themselves, rather than the doctor talking about their own situation or their own conditions. Certainly, it's appropriate to make a, a brief comment or a brief discussion about the doctor's health if it's similar to the patient's situation. But other than that, it is almost never appropriate for a doctor to be discussing their health their family situation or crises. Okay, it's one thing to, again, uh, you know, comment on where your children are, are going to school, as opposed to a lengthy discussion about your relationship with your spouse or the problems you may be having with your teenage children. Uh, physical contact. Obviously, to practice chiropractic, you have to be able to touch your patients. To protect yourself, doctors should communicate what they are doing and why. They should communicate before the touch. During the touch, they should be very careful about what they say and do. And then they should communicate after the touch. Depending upon the nature of, of where they are touching the patient, the level of the communication may be more or less. By communicating before the touch, you also give the patient an opportunity to say that they're not comfortable with the doctor going forward with that procedure. It is very rare or should be very rare that that occurs, but you want to pay close attention when it does occur because that's a message to you that the patient's not comfortable with you as a doctor. It may be better to send the patient to another doctor. It may be patient may be important for you to evaluate how you interact with these patients to be sure that you are interacting in an appropriate manner. With respect to hugging your patients, I've really got two answers. As a lawyer, uh, we're trained to give conservative advice to keep you out of trouble. And my advice as a lawyer is it is not appropriate for doctors to hug their patients. Now, as somebody who's worked with chiropractors for over 20 years, I know that there are some chiropractors out there who are going to hug their patients. I also am familiar with the uh, explanation that hugging patients helps communicate that the doctor cares and helps the patients become healthier sooner. And I agree with that explanation. But if a doctor is going to hug their patients, they ought to think carefully about why they are hugging their patients think carefully about which patients you are hugging. If the doctor is hugging only patients of the opposite sex within a certain age and weight range that they find attractive, that tells me that the hugging is for inappropriate reasons. On the other hand, if the doctor is truly hugging all of their patients, male and female, attractive and unattractive, then that may help support the argument that the doctor is doing this to help the patients become healthier. Uh, money. This boundary is pretty straightforward. You're supposed to be paid for your services. If the doctor is not collecting their fees or is discounting their fees or is waiving their fees, that is a sign that there may be something inappropriate in that doctor-patient relationship. Certainly there are good reasons for waiving your fees. If the doctor is waiving their fees, 
because the patient is have in financial need, that certainly is appropriate if that's the reason for waiving the fees. Uh, on the other hand, if the doctor is waiving the fees because the doctor wants to build up goodwill with the patient in hopes that the patient may be attracted to them, that is not appropriate. Uh, bartering. There is no rule that prohibits the exchange of services, but any time a doctor enters bartering, it's a good idea to have a nice clear agreement, even a short written agreement, that explains the exchange of value. Here's the value of the services provided by the doctor. Here's the value of services provided by the patient. That helps make it clear to everybody that they're getting a, a good even exchange. The last boundary is language. Think carefully about the words you use with your patients. Use an appropriate vocabulary. doesn't mean you have to use the most technical professional term. Uh, but you should use language that they understand. There's a difference between describing uh, an injury as a contusion or a bruise or a boo-boo and use the appropriate language for your patient. Language also includes your tone of voice and your body language. Most of what we communicate is not through the words. Most of what we communicate is through our tone of voice and our body language. So think carefully about how you were communicating with your patients, how close you were standing with them, towards them, whether you're invading their personal space or whether they, they seem comfortable with where you are. Uh, body language can also include things like leering or looking the female patient up and down when you meet them. Uh, be very careful about how you interact with your patients. Uh, referring to people as honey, sweetie, and cutie is something that is inappropriate. Uh, it's not only inappropriate in, in, in doctor-patient relationships, it's probably inappropriate in other circumstances as well. Of course, whistling at your patients is not a good idea. And we've already talked about referring to the females in the office as the girls. Use their names again. So what are the consequences of breaking these rules? I think everybody remembers President Clinton and his famous statement, I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Of course, that turned out to be a lie, and telling that lie is what got President Clinton impeached. Uh, Mark Twain, I think, gives a pretty accurate description of the delights of this world. Man cares most for sexual intercourse. He will go to any length for it, risk fortune, character, reputation, life itself. Uh, doctors who engage in sexual misconduct with their patients are taking a tremendous risk. Of course, the first risk is criminal uh, conviction. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, sex without consent is considered a criminal sexual assault and patients are deemed to not be able to consent to sex with their health care providers. In addition, uh, state boards can discipline the chiropractor's license, and that discipline may include revocation, meaning the license is permanently taken away, or suspension for a period of time, or conditions on the ability of the doctor to continue to practice. Uh, I think state boards tend to immediately go to the more severe punishments when they are faced with cases of sexual misconduct. Once they make a determination that sexual misconduct is cur has occurred, uh, they are likely to impose a much more serious disciplinary action. That doctor also faces risk of malpractice lawsuits or civil lawsuits. These are the kinds of cases where juries sometimes come back with big verdicts. It is very easy for them to find the doctor's conduct very offensive and very cold-hearted and that the patient suffered tremendous uh, emotional distress and mental anguish. And those, again, are the kinds of things. There's no hard dollar or no fixed value for those kinds of damages. So juries can have the discretion to come back with a very large amount of damages. Uh, worse than that, your malpractice policy is designed to cover accidents. Uh, 
uh, it is not an accident to date a patient for several months. And most malpractice policies will exclude coverage for that kind of sexual misconduct. It is also likely that the judgment the patient receives in that kind of malpractice case is not going to be dischargeable in bankruptcy. So the doctor is faced with a situation where they have no insurance to help pay the verdict or the judgment, and they have no way to escape the judgment by filing bankruptcy to get a fresh start. And lastly, the even the, the mere allegation, mere suspicion of sexual misconduct, mere rumor of sexual misconduct, can do tremendous damage to the doctor's reputation and that can be very difficult if not impossible to repair. And best example of that would be Coach Joe Paterno from Penn State. Uh, Coach Paterno was one of the most respected coaches in college football. I think everybody had a great deal of confidence in, in, in the idea that he would follow the rules. He was not somebody who would break the rules to win at all cost. Uh, unfortunately, he had an assistant coach who committed or who committed sexual misconduct with young boys supposedly on the campus in the locker room because coach Paterno was supposedly aware of that and failed to stop that misconduct uh, he lost his job uh, and died shortly thereafter and he went from being the kind of coach where they had a statue of him outside the stadium to where they took the statue down Hopefully as time goes on, he may be able, he and his family may be able to re rehabilitate his reputation, but certainly that is a testament to the kind of damage this allegation can do uh, to your reputation. So that concludes this class on uh, boundaries. We've talked about confidentiality and sexual misconduct. If you are taking this class for continuing education credit, you must go to the website on Blackboard and take the examination and pass it successfully. And then once you have passed that examination, the Continuing Education Department uh, will either send you a voucher or send the report to the State Board. Uh, please be sure you read their communications carefully uh, and, and comply with the requirements they have. Uh, thank you very much.